Well, uh, let me offer an apology first. I noticed that second song in the worship set had this line, open up the floodgates. After all the rain this week, we're, we're going to edit that song, third hour, to say, close the floodgates, please Jesus, right? I just thought of the irony of singing that. Um, this morning, I, I've been thinking about uh, what it is to be in a time of waiting. And I don't know about you, but I, I wrestle with patience. Waiting is not something that comes supernatural to me. Um, and, and I know this is true because I have three kids, five and under, and there's, it's a law of the universe that your kids and their um, ability to move quickly is inversely proportionate to how much of a hurry you're in. So the more I'm in a hurry and saying, kids, we got to go, they're like, butterfly, I'm going to chase this. I'm like, no, like, get in the car. We're going to be late, right? Waiting is hard because it feels like this place of sort of wasted time and we've got places to be and things to do. I remember this particular moment uh, for Lauren and I, we were on our honeymoon and we'd been backpacking in southern Chile in in the mountains and we were getting ready to leave the mountains. We had to catch a bus uh, into Argentina to the next city that we were going to stay in. So that meant this morning we had to get up at like 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, pack up our stuff, hike down the mountain, and then catch a bus at the bottom of the mountain. So we do this, we get to the bottom of the mountain, and we find out that the bus doesn't actually come uh, to the, the little visitor center at the bottom of the mountain. It was another four or five miles out in the middle of nowhere to catch the bus. They had a shuttle that you could take, but the shuttle didn't come for like another hour, hour and a half. So I told Lauren, I said, hey, we've been backpacking. Let's just walk the four miles, right? And by this time, it's like three o'clock in the afternoon. It's heat of the day. We've been up since 3.30. We haven't showered all week. Uh, Side note, I always tell couples in pre-marriage counseling, hey, you're going to encounter conflict. They never believe me. They're like, no, like we're in love. We know each other so well. And I just want to like hold their faces and say, yeah, but do we know each other? Like haven't showered for four days. Husband makes a bad decision well. Do you know each other like that, right? Because you're going to have conflict. So this wasn't like a fun walk, like, oh, let's catch the bus. We were like, we're over it, right? We smell bad. The sun is beating down on us. We get to this bus depot, and we're waiting for the bus to come. And like five minutes before the bus should have left that station, there's no bus. Five minutes late, 10 minutes late, 20 minutes late. I'm like in full-blown, irrational, dehydrated mode, like, Okay, if we have to survive in the Chilean outback, like we can bust into this bus depot, we can survive on Cheetos and Gatorade for three days as we wait for this bus to come, right? Now it's like a half hour, 45 minutes late, and I start asking myself all sorts of questions. Does the bus even stop here? Is, did we miss the schedule? Maybe the bus came early and we already missed that opportunity to hop on the bus. Maybe, maybe we're just not even in the right place. Finally, the guy who's manning this bus depot, he walks out looks at his watch and he goes, could be another hour, maybe two, shrugs his shoulders and walks back in the bus depot. And I'm like, oh, uh, this isn't good. Like, we're going to have to wait a little bit while longer. And and what I realized, though, was that my concept of time and and his was was just different. In in South America, particularly in the, the outback of Chile where we were at, they're used to delays. And so where I'm panicking because the bus isn't on time, they're going, this is no big deal. This is routine. This happens. But we had different time frames. We had different concepts of how we thought schedules and time should function. And, and I've noticed this spiritual parallel too. Here's this observation I want to make for you. That sometimes God's timeline and my timeline do not line up the way that I wish that they would. Anybody resonate with that? That I have a plan for my life that I think should unfold a certain way. And sometimes God leads me into this place where it feels like my plan for my life is put on pause. Maybe for you, this looks like you thought at this time in your life, you would be, you'd be married and you'd have a couple of children and that hasn't come to pass. Maybe in, in your career, you thought you would have the corner office with the fancy title and that hasn't come to be. Fill in the blank with what's your story of waiting on God, where it feels like he has put your plan for your life on hold and you go, God, this doesn't fit my timeline. But often I found that God's timing doesn't align with our timing. And often God will lead us to a season where we're forced to wait. So here's the question I want to wrestle with today. How do we navigate a season of waiting? And how do we do that well? So as we wrestle with this question, I want to look at the people of Israel and the people of Judah during the time of Jeremiah the prophet. At this time in the history of the people of Judah, the the political landscape around them is shifting. 
the ancient empire of Egypt had, had for a long time been the world power of the ancient Near East. As things shifted politically, now there's this empire of Babylon that, that quickly takes over. And very quickly, Jerusalem is conquered and the people of Judah are carried off in exile. And they find themselves in a place where it feels like their plan for their life is on hold. Follow along with me, if you would, in Jeremiah chapter 29, beginning in verse 1. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother, the eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the metal workers had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, the too long didn't read version is, Jeremiah sent a letter. Verse four, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it's a lie that they're prophesying for you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and I will bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and places where I've driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. What a tough thing. The people of Judah have been conquered and, and they've taken the leadership and, and, and the people of, of Jerusalem and they carried them into exile in Babylon and forced them to serve under King Nebuchadnezzar. I, I think it's safe to say that for the people of Judah, this was not in their five-year strategic plan. Like, hey, five years from now, it'd be great if we were conquered and we'd love to be living in captivity in Babylon. Right? This isn't a thing that they wanted. And, and so I think we could safely say that for them, this is a pause in their plan. This is not something that they wanted to be part of their timeline. And they enter this incredibly long, verse 10 says, 70 years that they will be in ba Babylon. So they enter this incredibly long season of waiting. And as Jeremiah writes this letter, I think he says some profound things about how the people of Judah and Israel can survive in this season of waiting where it feels like their plan for their life is put on hold. So there's a couple things before we dive into this question, how do we navigate a season of waiting? There's a couple baseline things I want us to know. First, I think we have to remember that in a season of waiting, that God still has a plan for his people. Verse 11 says this, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Now, the problem with this is my second point. Remember, God has a plan for his people. Number two, recognize that sometimes God's plan involves what seems like a season of setback or waiting. I mean, notice verse 4. Verse 4 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile. Now, we like 2911, right? I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you hope in a future. But what's harder for us to comprehend is that in verse 4, God says, Yeah, by the way, I sent you to exile. This is somehow part of God's plan. And what I want us to understand is that sometimes a season of waiting where your plan and my plan for our lives is put on pause, sometimes that's exactly the place that God wants us to begin to do a work in us. So in a season of waiting, number one, remember that God has a plan. Number two, recognize that sometimes God's plan for us looks like what seems to be a season of setback or waiting. Now, I hope there's all sorts of other questions. Why in the world would God do this? How do we navigate this? How do we find a way through? One of the things that stuck out to me as I read this portion of Jeremiah 29 is that, and, and I think verse 11 says it well, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for your welfare, not for evil. 
I think that's an interesting word choice. And I use the ESV translation on purpose. I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare. The, the NIV says plans to prosper you. And I was concerned that if we used the NIV and we said plans to prosper you, that we would immediately go to this place of, sure, God has this plan for my prosperity, my success, my financial security. But the word here that's translated in the ESV as welfare is this Hebrew word shalom. So if, if you were walking down the street and you were to greet someone in Hebrew and ask, how are you doing? You would ask them, ma shalom ha, which literally translates to how is your peace or how is your well-being? You see, this, this phrase, I know the plans I have for you, plans for your welfare, is something deeper than success. This is something deeper than financial security. God says, at the core of all things, what I want is at a soul level for you to be whole and complete and well, to be dwelling in peace with me. And here's the conclusion I think we can draw from this passage. Hold with me here. Is that God is much more concerned about our holiness than he is about our happiness. That doesn't sound very American dreamlike, does it? God is much more concerned about our holiness. And a holy life is about a life that reflects his character. It means that we're being formed and shaped as a people who reflect our Father. God is much more concerned about our holiness than he is about our happiness. And this is a really, really good thing. I think happiness is all about an emotional response to external circumstances. So when my circumstances are good, I respond emotionally in a way that says, I'm happy, this is what I want, I'm, I'm doing okay. On the, on the other side, when our, when our circumstances externally are not good, we often might say, I'm just really unhappy with where I'm at right now. Here's the thing. Welfare wholeness, completeness. Elsewhere, this word is translated peace. It's a deep, abiding peace. It's much more sure and steadfast than an emotional response of happiness. God doesn't want us to just be happy at a gut, soul, core of your being level. God wants you to be well. And sometimes, church, that means that God has to come to our lives and put our plan for our lives on hold and say, listen, I have another purpose that's deeper than just your happiness. And, and I think here's this question that I hope is resonating for us. Will we love and follow God in seasons of setback and waiting, just like in seasons of progress and plenty? Because it's, it's easy. I love 2911. I know the plans you have for me, plans for my welfare, not to harm me. I will follow you when things are good. But when things turn and our external circumstances aren't good, are we willing to follow God into that place where my life plan for my life isn't being fulfilled? It's, it's not progressing the way that I hope. And, and I think in that season where our plan is on pause, we ask God all sorts of questions. What are you doing? Do you even care? I'm frustrated that my life isn't moving forward the way that I want it to. God, what are you up to? And I think it brings us back again to that question, how do we navigate a season of waiting? As we dive into that, I think it's important for us as we figure out what it is to navigate life in a season of waiting to keep perspective. And the first thing I think that helps us keep perspective is to recognize that a pause in my plan doesn't mean I'm in a holding pattern. A pause in my plan does not mean I'm in a holding pattern. And what I mean by this is uh, when planes are coming in for a landing, right, they often line up one behind the other. As one plane is landing and the next plane is waiting, they will fly in a pattern where they're not making progress towards the destination. They're not moving further away. It's just sort of, I'm going to mix metaphors, like they're treading water just waiting there, right? Nothing's happening. They're not getting any closer to where they want to be. They're just waiting, and it feels like a place of, of passiveness where nothing's happening and the pilot's just sort of biding his time, waiting for his chance. I think sometimes for us, when God puts our plan on hold, we feel like we're in a holding pattern and like nothing is happening. And it feels for us like a place of passiveness where God's not doing anything. And our temptation, I think, is for us to likewise not invest. I think the second thing that we can do to keep perspective is to recognize that a pause in our plan does not mean a pause in our growth and preparation. A pause in our plan does not mean a pause in our growth and preparation. Because I think sometimes when God puts my plan for my life on hold, I feel like I'm not moving anywhere. I'm not making any progress. Nothing is happening. And I think, isn't there something I should be learning and growing and doing right now? But God, this feels like just such a passive place. What are you up to? What are you doing? How do I find a way forward? 
How many people love a waiting room? Like at the doctor's office, you love that. You get to sit in there in those really weird, uncomfortable chairs for like a half hour before you go wait in the smaller room and after the nurse comes, you wait again. Who, who just loves that experience? Nobody, right? It's awful. And, and the waiting room is this place, it's, it's kind of like purgatory, right? You just sit there, you're waiting, nothing's happening. They're almost never on time. And, and it's this place that just feels like such passive space. And often when we sit in the waiting room, like we pick up a magazine that we could care less about, right? And it seems like it's always the same ones, like Popular Mechanics, Us Weekly, People Magazine. These must be like a packet of like waiting room materials for doctor's offices. They all get the same ones and they're all terrible, right? Or, or we pull out the phone and you beat like 10 levels on Angry Birds before the nurse comes to call you, right? And we, we just sort of passively tread water and bide our time waiting for something to happen, and, and I think in a spiritual sense, when God places a pause in our plan or in our timeline, I think we often enter the season of passive waiting going, okay, God, when's something going to happen? But here, here's what I want to suggest to you this morning, is that a season of waiting is not a season to survive, but it's a space in which to be shaped. A season of waiting is not a season to survive, but it's a space in which to be shaped that actually that place where God has placed our plan for our lives on hold is precisely the place where God wants to form us and shape us and do something in us. Verse 10 says, for thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. I will fulfill for you my promise. 70 years. This is a long season of waiting. Verse 12 says, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. Then, it's significant that verse 12 begins with the phrase then because what happens is this season of God being found by the people of Israel. He says, you will seek me, you will find me. There's this renewed spiritual life in the people of Judah that comes after 70 years of waiting. And I think what we see for them is that God is using this season where their plan for their life is on pause. He's using it to form and shape them to be the kind of people who are ready for what's to come next. But that's a hard place. To be in that place where it feels like our plan for our life is on pause and it feels like God isn't doing too much. But we have to remember, just because our plan for our life is on pause does not mean we're in a holding pattern, and it does not mean that there's a pause in our growth and preparation. In fact, I think it means the opposite, that God is using that season of life to shape us and form us as people who reflect his character. In fact, I think seasons of waiting have the ability to form in us two really important things. I think a season of waiting can form in us a greater dependence on God and a greater desire for God. If you would go back in the story to Jeremiah chapter two, there's this beautiful and poetic moment where God is again, he's speaking through Jeremiah and it says, thus says the Lord, Jeremiah two, says, I remember, this is God speaking to Judah, speaking to Israel. He says, I remember the devotion of your youth. How as a bride you loved me, you followed me through the desert, through a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. What God is saying in Jeremiah 2, he says, I remember this time when my people, capture this image, my people pursued me with the passion and the zeal of a young bride pursuing her lover. God says, in fact, you loved me so much that you were willing to pursue me even into a desert place. But notice in in, in Jeremiah 2, it says, I remember God's recalling a time past. Because as you continue reading through Jeremiah 2, what you discover is that God says, what fault did your forefathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? God says in Jeremiah 2, I led you into a place of abundance and you forgot me there. Jeremiah 2.13 says, My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that don't hold water. I, I love this metaphor. A fountain is a source of water that continues to bubble and give life. A cistern is just a container for water. The cistern has to be filled from a source. And what God said is the people of Israel have forsaken him, the spring of life, and they've tried to do it on their own. I think this is important for us. We often equate maturity to independence. I mean, this is, if you have kids, this is what you're raising your kids to do. You want them by the time they're 18 or 27 to be independent and self-sustaining, right? 
And so we equate independence with maturity, but spiritually this works in the reverse. Spiritual maturity does not look like independence and me doing life on my own. Spiritual maturity looks like me being entirely and fully dependent on God and drawing my life from him. That's shalom, that's wholeness, that's well-being is found in relationship with him. And what we see is that God led Israel to a place of abundance in Jeremiah 2. And in that place of abundance, the people of Israel go, we're pretty good. We're pretty competent. We've got this thing on lockdown. And they get a little lackadaisical and they start drawing away from God, thinking that they can do it on their own. And and I think part of the reason that God leads them to this place of waiting 70 years in in Babylon is verse 12. Then you will call upon me and come and pray. And God is renewing in them a place of dependence. And he's renewing in them a place of desire for God himself. He says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. And sometimes God leads us through a season of waiting that feels like a season of brokenness. And really what it is, is God has to cut away the calluses on our heart and create in us a new sensitivity to his voice. So how do we thrive in this place? How do we not just let it be a place of passiveness where we try to bide our time and wait for what's next? Jeremiah says a couple really fundamentally important things to the people of Judah on how to survive a season of waiting. Verse 5 says this. Jeremiah says, Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Now, I'm not a real estate agent, but I'm told that the number one rule of real estate is location, 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 right? Right? And now Jeremiah says, oh, by the way, build a house in Babylon. No, I I don't want to build a house in Babylon. I want to go back to Jerusalem because that's where I'm from. That's my home. I'm living in captivity. I'm living in exile here. This is not where I want to be. And what, what Jeremiah tells the people of Israel is intentionally invest your lives in this place. And, and here's what I think happens in a season of waiting where it feels like my plan is on pause. I think we often do a couple things. I know I do. We often look to the past And remember, oh, those were the glory days. Or we mourn that the past was not what we had hoped, and we say maybe in the future there's something really good out there. And so what happens is we live in this tension of focus on the past and focus on the future, but we're never present right in the present moment where God is forming and shaping us to be the kind of people who are ready for the future he has for us. We have to be intentionally invested and live present in the present moment. And so what Jeremiah says is, this is not wasted time. He says, take new ground, build houses, plant vineyards, eat their produce. He says, increase, do not decrease. In other words, continue to move forward in the things that you know to do and invest your life in this place. And then Jeremiah goes too far. Right, that's one thing. I don't want to build a house in in Babylon. I'm from Jerusalem. I want to go back there. And then sometimes it's like, Jeremiah is a good prophet. Keep your mouth shut, right? Because he goes on and he says this next thing. And I think this is a core part of thriving in a place of waiting. He says this in verse 7. But seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. And what Jeremiah tells the people of Judah, he says, I want you to spiritually invest in the current community and context that you're a part of. Spiritually invest in the current community and context that you are a part of. Now, what I want to do, if I'm in Babylon in captivity, I'm just biding my time, waiting to get through, waiting for what's next. And not only does Jeremiah say, no, invest your life in this place. He says, I want you to be spiritually aware of what God is doing in this place. And in fact, I want you to pray for the welfare of your captors. Ah, I don't want to do that. And and let let me bring this home a little bit more. Probably nobody in here is living in exile or captivity. But maybe tomorrow morning, your alarm's going to go off and you're going to head to a place that for you feels like exile and captivity at work, right? 
And, and maybe it's uh, like you would love your job, but my boss is so incompetent and he just it drives me nuts and he's insecure. And, and so he steals all of the attention when our group does something well and you just can't stand that person. And it feels like, God, why are you leaving me here? And maybe you've put out a hundred resumes and no door opens. And so you're stuck in this place with a boss that you can't stand. And, and every day it's like, I'm not bringing my A game to work. I'm going to bring my C game. You know, so when my break's over, I'll play that extra game of solitaire before I go back to work and I'm just going to bide my time. Maybe Jeremiah would say, no, 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 bring your A game to that place. And I think Jeremiah would say, pray for the wealth, that boss that you cannot stand, who you watch, how their insecurities affect how they function. Pray for the welfare of that person. And, and here's what struck me about this passage is that so often when I come to a season of waiting, I'm frustrated because I feel like God left me here. But listen, maybe God called you there because he wanted you to have spiritual influence on the people around you. You know what that means? It's not all about me. Oh, Jeremiah, why couldn't you leave well enough alone? Right? Let me just dislike my boss, try to get through, bide my time and move on to what's next. I don't know, maybe, maybe you're a stay-at-home mom and you've gotten connected with a, a community of, of other moms, but maybe every time you go, you feel like it's a comparison game about milestones for your kids and how much money your husbands make or how nice your house is and mine's never clean enough and you just feel like, okay, I'm in this group of people and I need community, but ah, sometimes that drives me nuts. Maybe Jeremiah and through God is saying to you, pray for the welfare of those people. Sometimes a pause in my plan is so that God can unfold his purpose in a specific context where he's called me to spiritually invest. And sometimes we get frustrated that God has asked us to have influence in a place that we would rather not be. I don't want to be in Babylon. I want to go home. I want to go back to Jerusalem. I want to be in that place. And God is saying, no, no, no. Use your voice here. Pray for the welfare of these people. And what strikes me is that four times in this whole passage that we just read, four times the word welfare or shalom is used. A key theme in this entire passage in this season of waiting is God's shalom, God's welfare, our well-being in the midst of waiting and for the people with whom we're waiting with. So how do you thrive in a season of waiting? Number one, invest your life there intentionally. Number two, spiritually serve in your current context and community. So how do we respond? Maybe you're in a season of waiting right now where it feels like your plan for your life is on hold. How do you respond in that place? I want to leave you with, with five things, and I'm, I'm going to hit them quick. I feel like each one of these could be a sermon in itself, but I think they're important for understanding how to navigate a season of waiting. The first is this. It's surrender your plan to God's purpose. Surrender your plan to God's purpose. So often, I have a plan for how I want things to go, and God puts my plan on hold because he's got something that purposely and purposefully he wants to do in me and through me in that place. And sometimes it means I have to set my plan aside and take up his purpose. And I think, catch this church, I think sometimes what feels like a pause is actually a change in trajectory. And God says, listen, I have a purpose for you that looks different than your plan for you. Can you surrender into that? And if you're like me, you go kicking and screaming, right? Secondly is, is this, uh, be at peace with God's process. And I don't just mean like try hard not to be upset when your plan is on hold. What I mean is come before the God of all creation, fall on your knees and tell him, I am frustrated that my plan isn't unfolding the way that I hoped. Can you grace me to find your shalom, your peace, your well-being in a place that I just don't understand? Help me, Father, to be at peace in the process that you're unfolding, even when it doesn't make sense. Three, commit to prayerfully seeking God's presence. I love what he says to the people of Israel. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you. And, and church, hold to this. Remember, God has a plan. Recognize sometimes it looks like a season of setback and waiting. But listen, in that place, God is not trying to hide himself from you. I will be found by you, God says. And in that season of waiting, commit yourselves to prayerfully and intentionally seeking God's presence. Number four, hold to God's promise. Verse 10 says this, I will uphold my promise to you, God says, and I will bring you back to this place, back to Jerusalem. And maybe you're in a season of waiting, and in that place you have to trust God's promise that his plan and his purpose is for your welfare. And finally, invest passionately in God's mission. Build houses, 
plant vineyards, invest your life in that place, and pray for the welfare of the people around you, even when you feel like you're in a season of waiting. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we confess today that sometimes it's really difficult when you put our plan on hold. We have this idea of, of how we think things are going to go, and sometimes, Father, uh, our plan doesn't unfold that way. God, I pray that in the midst of a season of waiting, that you would help us to be a people who are at peace with the process that you're unfolding in our lives. God, would you, would you grace us to not just be concerned about my plan being upended, but God, would you grace us to be concerned with, okay, I'm here, I'm waiting, I'm in this holding pattern, but God, help us to invest spiritually in the community and context that for whatever reason you've called us to be a part of for a season. And maybe it's a season longer than we'd hoped for. But God, I pray that we would remember that a season of waiting doesn't mean a pause in our, our, our growth and preparation. That God, sometimes that's exactly the place where you are shaping us and forming us to be a people who are ready for what you have next. So God, I pray for those this morning who are in a season of waiting. God, may they not see it as a season to survive, but may they see it as a space in which they'll be shaped. Father, we love you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy for us. We pray this in Jesus' name.